Beginnen jullie strikt om tien uur? Ik denk dat we Bart klaar is, dank je wel. Bart is klaar. Als iedereen zit, dan... Welcome everybody, and thank you for being here in, in such wonderful numbers. Uh, this is the fourth lecture in a series of ten on questions of just transformations in urban mobility. And today I want, today I want to talk about cities, urban development and infrastructure. And in the next hour we'll, uh, we'll talk more about human behaviour. Now, why should we care about urbanization. I think this is one of the most powerful graphs I can imagine. Uh, this is sort of showing on the very long term the absolute growth in, in the global population and it shows clearly that the 21st century. 
is uh, the urban age, where for the first time in history, more people live in cities, in urban areas, than in rural areas. And of course, we can sort of have all kinds of discussions about what, how we define the urban, but it is quite clear that we see an enormous intensification of, uh, uh, of, of areas where people live. And that creates all kinds of issues, not least congestion, not least uh, in a context of gradually growing incomes, uh, car dependence, and a range of other issues. So two cities here where I've had the privilege to become involved in, in studies on transport and the challenges that intensification brings. Now, these two cities, Accra and Ghana, and Manila in the Philippines are very different, not least because of their historical development tra trajectories. But both cities have seen enormous issues in integrating land use planning and transport planning, which for s many of us is the holy grail of how we should go about making our cities more sustainable. So what we see happening is an enormous push for the creation of high capacity public transport systems. More metros and particularly more bus rapid transit systems. This is a graph from a couple of years ago, it shows sort of the distribution of metro systems around the world. Um, we see a lot of activity around public transport, but at the same time, we do see the enduring appeal of building motorways, flyovers in particular. And we see that governmental capacity to realize these kinds of systems is often a barrier. So people, when we're talking about bus rapid transit, always refer to the familiar case of Curitiba, which has sort of since the 70s been building bus rapid transit systems and integrating that with land use and housing policy, uh, and is widely seen as the example of best practice. Uh, the model has been exported to all kinds of other cities with varying levels of success. Accra is a very interesting example. The Ayalolo system, which means so much as let's go, is a BRT light system. It was set up in um, about 10 years ago. Um, no, sorry, about five years ago. It, it ran from 2016 until 2018 on, on, two, on, on three routes uh, in the city and then was grounded due to financial issues, institutional fragmentation and lack of p political will. There was a new administration under a new president who was very keen to undo what the previous administration had built. Um, so for a long time, these buses sort of set idle. They were redeployed the late 2019 on a subset of, of routes uh, into Accra, but their modal share is very, very small and uh, they're not very popular. They uh, sort of studies show that people think they are really for high income residents. So all sorts of issues with these kinds of um, systems in various places around the world. And yet, transit-oriented development, accessibility, development of public transport and active travel remain revert strategies for reducing CO2 emissions and addressing all kinds of other sustainability issues. And they play a central role in the avoid, shift, improve framework that I showed in one of the previous lectures and you can see I've highlighted in red how central they are. And that revered position is partly a consequence of a wide-ranging body of academic research by transport, urban planning and public health researchers who have offered strong evidence in favour of transit-oriented development, investment in public transport, cycling and walking, the, the, the work of people like Peter Newman, Kenworthy, Robert Severo, Susan Handy, Larry Frank, sort of some of, the, some of the big shots in this field. And of course, others have made significant contributions to this as well, not least Frank and his team here in, here in, Gelt, here in Ghent. And I think that work is extremely valuable 
but it also depends on a wide range of abstractions. It sort of excludes a range of processes through which built environments and urban fabrics come into existence and evolve over multiple timescales. So what I want to do in this hour is talk a little bit more on about these abstractions and reflect critically on them. Think about urban fabrics and infrastructures as processes rather than as things that are out there. And think of urban fabrics and infrastructures as they are experienced in everyday life. I've shown you previously this slide of the work of uh, Alfred Nord Whitehead, who wrote about 20 years ago um, when he published his most influential books, in, in which he tried to work through the implications of the insights from Darwinism, relativity theory, and quantum mechanics for how philosophers think, and in particular for the basis, the, the sort of the taken for granted metaphysical assumptions of their thinking. And his argument was that philosophy had remained too wedded to Newtonian understandings of space, time, and the world. And a century later, I would say that this argument still holds true for how many transport professionals and researchers make sense of and understand transport systems and cities. Now, Whitehead developed a very complex metaphysical system that took on board the lessons of biology, physics, and mathematics, which was his original discipline, which led him to think about and in terms of process. And as part of that, he wrote extensively about processes of abstraction in thought and scientific practices. And abstraction for him is about selection of certain elements. Um, it's about exclusion. It's about simplifications. And uh, abstraction was really a key concern for him. And you could, argue, you could argue that his work is an experiment in developing ways of thinking that abstract differently from what was common at the time. This is from one of his books. Uh, Science in the Modern World, uh, where he writes on, uh, on abstraction. And these are probably amongst his most widely quoted sentences. And, and they, they underpin what he calls the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So he writes, he, he basically argues that we need to think, we need abstraction in order to think, in order to do research. Um, but the risk is that we abstract things that really matter to the things, the processes that we want to understand. And he argues that we constantly need to be looking at and, and asking ourselves what the consequences are of the abstractions that we make. Because the risk is always that we end up with what he calls the fallacy of mispleased misplaced concreteness, in which we substitute abstract concepts for the messiness, the complexity that constitutes the world in which we live. The risk is that by doing so, we generate insights that occlude and obscure our understanding of what is actually happening in the world. Now, abstraction is not necessarily problematic and we need it, but if we want to understand travel behavior and everyday mobility practices and what changes those and what the role of interventions in the built environment in that is, we need to ask ourselves a series of questions. What effects do the abstractions that we usually commit to generate? What do they prevent us from seeing? And does this matter? A key question, does it matter for whom and in what context? I would argue that this is particularly important when we think about the literature on the relationship between urban form and travel. We look at the benefits or otherwise of transit-oriented development. We think about the consequences of building infrastructures for cycling 
public transport because that literature, that academic literature, is full of quite strong abstractions. Enter the five Ds, which is a well-known framework used to summarize the key aspects of how the built environment is supposed to, in to, to influence people's travel behavior, which is about density, diversity, design, destination, accessibility, and distance to transit. Where density is, um, is measured as whatever is of interest uh, per, per unit of area. So typically population, can be buildings, can be employment, can, can be floor area. Diversity is about the number of different land users in a, in a given area and the extent to which they are represented in land area, floor area, or employment. So quite often people use entropy measures of diversity. We also quite often use jobs housing ratios or jobs population ratios. ratios. Design is essentially about street networks and uh, sort of expressed in, in things like uh, their connectivity, the number of uh, uh, four-way intersections, um, the number of intersections per square mile. It's about sidewalk coverage, particularly important in the American context. It's about uh, whether the streets have trees, other physical variables that different, differentiate pedestrian-oriented environments from car-oriented environments. Destination accessibility is about the ease of access to trip attractions at the local or the regional level, so things like distance to the CBD, distance to the nearest shop, the number of jobs or, uh, or, or, um, or employment uh, uh, within a given travel distance, and finally distance to transit is typically measured as the average of or the shortest uh, distance, shortest street routes from residences to workplaces in an area to the, uh, so, or, or um, in terms of distance to the, the nearest rail station. Very well uh, developed this framework, heavily used, lots of meta reviews out there that you can draw on that kind of show Density is the most important of these variables, but they're quite strongly correlated. And they do sort of, uh, sort of higher uh, uh, densities, higher diversity lead to uh, shorter car distances, more trips by uh, public transport and walking and cycling. Another very well-known framework is that uh, for measuring walkability developed by Larry Frank and colleagues um, in, uh, in Vancouver, which kind of builds on what I've just discussed. It's essentially a, a normalization of uh, intersection density, residential density, retail, retail floor area ratio, land use mix. So it, it combines questions of density, diversity, and design. And again, widely used, quite powerful, quite clearly correlated with uh, the, 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 the probability of people walking and the number of trips um, people take. So these, frame, th th these frameworks are really powerful and they make a lot possible. For one, they are relatively easy to compute with what are now standard geospatial data, at least in the global north, if you're doing this kind of work. In a city like Manila, it, you, you'll be hard pressed, but certainly in, in a city like Ghent, this would be relatively straightforward. Another advantage is that you can make comparisons uh, between locations, across time, between studies. And you can incorporate these indices, these measures, fairly straightforwardly in econometric models where you link them to some kind of indicator of travel behavior. So they are very usable. And I think that's part of the reason for their uh, popularity. On the other hand, they allow a number of things not to be done. They prohibit understanding of 
events and processes in which the physical environment participate. And that helps to constitute places rather than spaces. And of course, place is one of the most contentious concepts in geography. I here understand it very much in the way that Doreen Massey and others like, like Torsten Hegerstrand did, which is sort of, uh, in, in, in Doreen Massey's term, it's about thrown togetherness. It's about plays as woven out of encounters, trajectories that come together and, and that shape one another on an ongoing basis. So it's very difficult to, to think about place with these kinds of, with this literature. And as a result of that, it's also very dif difficult to think about differentiated experience of, of place. So if we think about inequalities, if we think about the way space is gendered, how it is classed, how it is racialized, it's very, very difficult to do that with these kinds of literature. And I think because it is so static, it's really difficult to make sense of how spaces and places participate and contribute to longer term transformations. So if we're thinking about just transformations to in mobility, these, fra th these frameworks are not particularly helpful, I would say. This is from a study of walkability in Shenzhen with a, a former PhD student I had the privilege to, to co-supervise with David Bannister. His name is uh, Eric Chan and he did a multi uh, a, a mixed method study of walkability in, in, in Shenzhen and started off with a series of interviews with uh, people in different parts of, of the city. And this is an, an excerpt of one of these, these interviews. It really brings to the fore how the built environment is really about a series of events and processes. It's always changing. And it's much more than simply physical. It's sort of about how the physical and the social, how the, the, the use of these spaces is developing over various timescales. It's also very much about differentiated experience of these places. And I think, again, if we're thinking about walkability, and if we think about walkability as it is actually experienced, we may need a different way of getting at the, is the issues than the kind of walkability initiatives developed by, by Frank and, and colleagues. And what we kind of see in this literature is a series of hidden assumptions. Now, this is very much based on, on, on the, the, the work of, of Whitehead. I won't go through everything, but I just want to highlight two particular things. One is that in the literature on travel behavior, we typically uh, assume that things have a simple location. White Hat calls that the fallacy of simple location, where we assume that physical entities have an independent, independent individuality that is fully describable apart from any reference to any other entity and without any reference to the past or the future. So its relations to other elements, its relations to the past are essentially stripped away. We, we pretend they don't matter. And we make particular understandings of, about the nature of causality, which we could sort of summarize in regulator, regu, regularity in, in conjunction. If an event A leads to an outcome B, often enough, we assume that A is the cause of B. That's the regularity in, in the co-occurrence of, of these two, two events. We can challenge these understandings. And I think that is relevant. Here's another example from the same study by, by Eric. And uh, it, it sort of demonstrate that inexperience, that assumption of simple location gets challenged because what this excerpt makes clear is that how people look or people experience the present is linked to the past, the future of the same location and also to their experiences of other locations elsewhere. So experience is here a specific case of a more general process 
that Whitehouse calls prehension, of which human perception is one form. We can understand prehension or perception as the reception and appropriation of the world by historically constituted individuals who interpret what they receive, perceive and appropriate above and below the fluctuating threshold of consciousness. Of course, this is based on interviews. So everything is based on conscious experience, but there's a whole layer of experience that remains beyond that. Um, and that also needs to be taken into account in our research. Now, in that process of perception, there is a lot of selection, simplification, reworking, and also the creation of potentials for action. So what we see here, what we begin to see here, is that the body, the mind and the world are quite strongly related. If we think of the world and everything in it as a sequence, as, as sequences and trajectories of interconnected events in which each particular event is an occasion of experience, a term that, that Whitehead uses, not in the sense of conventional conscious human experience, but a more general sense of exposure to past and concurrent events, which are received, transformed, and integrated into the, into the particular event in question. So this thinking about these interconnections and, and the interwovenness of body, mind, and world has an, an, a series of consequences. My body, my mind, and its environment are not neatly separated, but interwoven. We could say that any emotions or sense of enjoyment that seems to be mine is nothing other than my mind reacting to the environment I am experiencing. And this experience is mediated by my body through which I sense the environment and the trajectories of previous events that have constituted my mind and my body, where those trajectories are synthesizing the body's and mind's own history with their environments on an ongoing basis. We just end up with a fundamental togetherness. The world and the body are in the mind whilst the mind alongside the body are in the world, and the mind and the world are in the body. So everything is in each other, you could say. Another way of stating this is to say that body, mind, and world are mutually imminent to one another. And this mutual imminence lies at the basis of a particular understanding of causality, where each event presupposes the world that precedes it as active in its own nature. This allows on the one hand for the transmission of order, like an element's character or properties, or in the case of human beings, human collectives, their dispositions, their tastes, their understandings. Oh, sorry. And it is this transition, sorry, this transmission of order that is responsible for the continuity and stability that exists in the world. This understanding of causality also allows for open-endedness. A change in the environment may be observed and invoke change in one of those properties, in one's views, in one's dispositions. So regularity is only quasi-stable and always of, at risk of becoming otherwise. So this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about causality than this idea of co-occurrence that I, I spoke about earlier and that you see here on the right-hand side. You sort of move away from this notion of regularity in conjunction to this idea of mutual imminence. Whitehead was very much interested in this because his, part of his, his project was to argue that the laws of nature that had been discussed by the likes of, of Newton were 
not so law-like as they seemed. They were always contingent upon time and place. They were contextual. And I think that is really important as well. We move away from a notion of universality to something that is much more con context specific. So, after all that philosophizing, where does that bring us? How do we go on from here? Well, I think one way in which we can take this forward is by analyzing the relationship of mobility with the urban environment and infrastructure in terms of mutual imminence. And we do that by thinking about intersecting trajectories of events and be very reflexible reflexive about where we draw boundaries because if everything is together and everything is fuzzy we do need to draw some boundaries and we do have to abstract things away the question is how do we do that one way in which we can do that is by thinking about the emergence and development of built environment of infrastructures in our study of um, the relationship between built environment or urban development and infrastructure with mobility. And there are some bodies of literature we can draw on. This, for instance, uh, there is, for instance, in critical geography, critical urban studies, a range of work that thinks about urban environments and infrastructures in terms of process. And David Harvey is key here, but so is uh, Neil Brenner and, of course, Eric Swingado. I said before I would celebrate Belgian scholarship, so I think it's really important to do that, and Eric has made seminal contributions to think about infrastructure in, in terms of process. The work of Harvey, however, is, 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 is very, very significant to what all these gentlemen are doing. Harvey proposed to understand urban development with the help of Marxism and developed a whole conceptual ab apparatus to which I cannot do any shred of justice here. But a key concept he develops is, is the spatial fix. It's about space-time interventions that seek to resolve the tensions within capitalism. Now, within Marxist thinking, the mobility of people and goods is generally goods, it's generally beneficial to capital accumulation. It allows more surplus value to be extracted. But this requires infrastructure. Infrastructures moor this circulation of people, goods, and ultimately also capital. But these infrastructures age. They deteriorate. They get overtaken by newer, flashier ones. So new rounds of innovation and technology developments make infrastructures uh, less attractive. That Acceleration and improvement of mobility creates unintended consequences and new tensions within capitalism and within capitalist cities. Think about congestion, which was an unintended consequence of the processes uh, of, of suburbanization, which were in, uh, initially meant to, to resolve some of the, 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 the tensions in capitalism. Think now also about air pollution. Think about how with cars and the, the development of particular types of urban uh, environments, we've become very sedentary and ultimately quite fat, which means that our capability to become productive and to uh, uh, aid this process of surplus value creation is potentially uh, compromised because of this. So what you see is that one set of spatial fixes get over time overtaken by new sets of spatial fixes. And this, I think, offers one way of thinking about changes that we often frame as sustainable. Sustainable urban development in many ways is about um, uh, solving some of the contradictions within the capitalist city. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about transit-oriented development or concepts as the the 15-minute cities. And there is some work that has done this for, for transit-oriented development, but I think far too little. Now, the figure you see here is not from Harvey, but is by Neil Brenner and is 
one of the most notorious figures of uh, sort of the past decade because this is sort of where the uh, this underpins and summarizes the, the the work on planetary urbanization which has become a very influential but also very con contested thesis i don't want to go into this but i just wanted to highlight this process of concentrated urbanization and differential urbanization in which processes like transit oriented development in a 15 minute city sit and there are other spatial fixes. You can think about cycling and cycling infrastructure as a spatial fix. And uh, there are many people, well, not many, but there are a couple of people who do that. Justin Spinney in Cardiff has written extensively about this. But uh, Adoni Alugo, who, who is uh, one of the UK's most uh, preeminent cycling activists, was really the first to do that. And this is from a paper that she published uh, in, in 2014 and it's sort of a very powerful quote talking about how to be a world-class city at least in the global north now you sort of think in terms of bicycles rather than than private cars and she sort of brings out this link with neoliberalism and uh, how sustainability marketing may be a gain for some and a loss for others and this is where it gets very important because cycling certainly in the UK is quite strongly classed and racialized. We see that to a lesser extent in, in the UK. We see even some of that in cycling countries like the Netherlands where there certainly there is a, 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 a racial dimension to cycling, who cycles, who doesn't. So. We can think about cycling as a spatial fix. And one example where we see that very clearly is in Portland, uh, on the west coast of the US, uh, Oregon. Um, very interesting case because, again, it's one of those examples of best practice in terms of how you uh, try to prevent uh, urban sprawl. The growth boundary concept was first applied systematically in this city. And Portland is now also keen to promote cycling and has this hugely ambitious plan called Central City 2035, uh, where they want to develop a green loop, which is a six mile linear park connecting people and places within and beyond Portland's downtown and neighborhoods and uh, sort of along the uh, Willamette River. So. Uh, Downtown is here and the other side of the river is sort of uh, um, many working class neighborhoods originally. So this project is clearly framed in terms of sustainability and equity. The Green Loop is supposed to support, and I'm quoting here, all people, residents, workers, students and visitors of all age, ages, shapes and sizes, origins and incomes. It will serve people all over Portland and the region as it will connect to bikeways from the wider region and take people to the heart of the city and back safely and easily. Very common framing that you see in, in many cities nowadays, but not without its critics. This is from a, a it's a study uh, led by Dylan Mahmoudi uh, was published about two years ago in Urban Geography, where they've actually looked into who would be benefiting from this project. Um, and the team developed a, a mixed method develop, uh, uh, methodology comprising focus groups, eight focus groups with almost 90 individuals across various parts of Portland. Uh, the group discussions, participatory mapping exercises, with, and, and many of the participants were from low-income households and were people of colour in neighbourhoods at risk of displacement through gentrification and marginalised, typically marginalised in conventional planning and consultation processes. And I think that is quite an important aspect because, of course, these kinds of plans are always... Uh, accompanied by, uh, by extensive consultation 
processes. But there are always questions about who is able and willing to participate in them. And we know from the large literature on, on participation and planning that uh, low-income households, people of colour, are less likely to participate, not, bec not necessarily because they don't want, but simply because they don't have the means, they don't have the resources, they don't have the time available to do that. They can't pay for childcare, for instance, those kinds of issues. And what they've shown in this study is that about two-thirds of the participants would not have direct access or even the opportunity to use this system. So I think what we're seeing here is really a discrepancy between the planning discourse and what is happening on the ground. But for me, this study is also a really nice example of how you can bring in processes of development into the analysis of travel behavior, travel opportunities, accessibility, and so on. Of course, the methodology can be pushed further, but it's one of the few examples of how you can think in more processual terms about uh, urban development and, and everyday travel behavior. Let's look at another example, which is from Dar es Salaam, uh, which houses the, 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 the very celebrated BRT system called DART, Dar es Salaam Rapid Transit, launched in 2016, and when it is eventually completed, will consist of 137 kilometers of new road in networks, 18 terminals, and 228 stations. It's funded with the support of the World Bank and uh, sort of uh, the ITDP, Institute for Transport and Development Policy, a transnational NGO that helps cities across the world to develop sustainable mobility, in particular BRT programs, has played a very strong role in, in, um, in the creation of this scheme. At the moment, only the first phase is completed, uh, but the rest is still, yeah, under construction. It's undeniable, however, it's, sorry, it's undeniable that DAR has significant problems. Road networks go back to colonial times and have seen very little expansion ever since, despite the massive growth in population. Public transport, is mostly old, it's at capacity, it's quite unsafe, and is done by minibuses, daladalas, locally called. Uh, and the idea is to phase them out and to kind of replace them with these, this BRT system, which again is a very common strategy we see across lots of Africa. Um, South Africa is a very good example of this and also of the, of the problems that this um, gives right to and um, yeah maybe that's for another time but th th this is in itself a very interesting area of research uh, that I think requires more attention from the international research um, community. Now there's been a couple of studies on the BRT system in, in Dar es Salaam and they range from extremely critical to relatively critical. Uh, and if you sort of synthesize that work, you could, you could argue that the DAR system is, is, is a mixed bag. There have been travel time reductions for commuters who live and work close to the stop. It benefits young people, older people, disabled individuals in particular. It's offers new opportunities for street vendors and stall holders at stations, and that's actually taken into account in the planning, which itself is a very good thing. You could argue it is successful to the extent that the buses are overcrowded, but part of that is also because the number of vehicles that is in operation is lower than was anticipated. There are, however, concerns over affordability, especially for low-income groups, there's significant gentrification along the route. There's displacement and marginalization of these minibus operators. And the system has enhanced vulnerability to flooding. 
So we can begin to see sort of a mixture of, uh, of, of consequences. And um, yeah, I think there is, there is more to be done here and, and more analysis to be done that sort of takes that processual dimension of the system into, into account. This also brings us to the question about how to think about infrastructure. Because I think it is really important that we move away from infrastructure as tracks and stuff that is out there that is neutral, static, a conduit for mobility, to thinking about infrastructure as a process that is always becoming, always information and co-evolving with its environment, its use and other infrastructures to which it is connected. Also to think about infrastructures as social technical, so material, but also discursive, also effective, and imbued with symbolism, aesthetic value, ambience, and politics. Because infrastructures are also power laden. They are configured by and reconfiguring norms, values, and ways of being for human subjects. And there's a lot of literature around this in anthropology, in uh, uh, certain strands of urban studies, urban geography, where there's been an infrastructural term, turn where people have sort of been, been looking about infrastructure in, in that more uh, processual and critical way. And I think it really matters for thinking about travel behavior, mobility, and urban development Two, this is a table that is too small for you to read at that distance, which doesn't really matter. Uh, but it is from a paper that I wrote with a postdoc in Oxford, uh, but former postdoc at Denver, Nixon, where we looked at uh, systems for bike sharing and sort of thought, tried to think about them as these kinds of processual infrastructures that are both socio-technical and power-laden. And we, we, we really tried to open up people's understanding of what constitutes a bike-sharing scheme as an infrastructure and looked at different schemes from the kind of uh, uh, dockless bike-share schemes uh, uh, run by um, mostly Asian companies underpinned by venture capital, i.e. Mobike. I assume that you have had Mobike in, in, in Ghent as well. All the way to uh, libraries of bikes for groups with particular needs, like this kind of bikes, which is from a project in London where um, a group of volunteers, a charity, uh, yeah, it's a charity run by volunteers who uh, rent out these bikes to uh, people with mostly uh, physical disabilities uh, in order for them to be able to uh, participate in the joys of cycling. They don't do this on the street, it's off streets, it's actually on, on a, in, in a sports venue, uh, run by volunteers and done on, on, on weekend days, for instance. And um, I think this is really an interesting way of thinking about infrastructure that moves beyond things out there, but sort of think about infrastructures as not only these bikes, which by the way are very expensive, they cost about three to five thousand pounds per bike, uh, but it is also about the work of the volunteers and the ambience they create because it's a very supportive environment. Of course, many of these people cannot cycle by their own, so they need support. That whole system, that whole conglomerate of elements, that's the infrastructure that allows cycling to happen. And it's a very ephemeral infrastructure because it effectively only comes into existence at times that this library is operating and this group is operating and these bikes become available. So it's, it's a very different understanding of infrastructure than, than we work with. And of course, this is a 
extreme case, you could say, but I think it's a good case to get us to think in what infrastructure can be and how we might want to analyze it as part of our research. And of course, that's quite different from these bikes, which is a picture I took in Beijing when I was there in, in 2018. It's not as big as some of the heaps of bikes uh, we've seen in the media, but still in a, in a busy neighborhood, university neighborhood, I thought it was quite impressive. As in previous lectures, I sort of want to end on three takeaway messages um, and sort of really try to summarize what I've tried to argue is, first of all, that the discourse, including the research and the links between the built environment and mobility or travel behavior is very dependent on quite strong abstractions that we not always are aware of and not always uh, um, uh, reflect on critically. That, relate, that creates a form of what Whitehead would call misplaced concreteness in the literature. And I think that matters because it expels both process and various forms of injustice from the literature. That's why I wanted to present that case of Portland. So working towards just transitions, just transformations, requires that we take account of the mutual imminence of urban development, infrastructure, and mobility. And I want to continue that journey in the next hour after coffee. Thank you. I'm sure we have time for some mm. questions, if there are any. Freke. Thanks a lot for your thought-provoking uh, talk with a lot of stimulating thoughts. Um, I guess I have a question that pertains more to the first part of the lecture, uh, around transit-oriented development. Um, I very much agree that, or I very much appreciate the call to really double down on this kind of other type of knowledge or the production of another kind of knowledge um, that is centered a lot more around lived experiences and subjective and not so much on the abstraction and the rigid indicators and the static and all of that. Um, but I was wondering how this, this other kind of scientific or epistemological, if you want, approach can really impact and win through in uh, processes of governance and decision making, the political reality of things. Um, because when it comes to transit oriented development, at least in the Flemish context, um, policy makers, um, decision makers still often very much rely on static elements, indicators, statistics. Um, and as you mentioned uh, later on, this is also a very, very power laden process. And so I was wondering how or what the challenges are that we envision in terms of really this intersection between how we do science, the kind of knowledge that we want to produce, versus the very yeah, things we do, do how it really translates into practice and the governance yeah. the process behind all of that. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Are we still recording? Okay, good. Uh, it is a challenging thing to, to change this approach, to, to change the way we do research and get it taken up. Um, and um, I have no illusions that this will happen um, like this. We will, it requires hard work. One of the things that really works is to create strong narrative, strong stories, really powerful stories. We haven't done, we, I've not managed to do that, but I'm sure you know the Newton and Kenworthy graph, which I deliberately did not put in the presentation. I didn't want to promote it any further than it's already been, being, being used. It basically sort of is, uh, it, it has density on the horizontal axis and it has uh, CO2 emissions or uh, energy use or, or VMT on, on the, the, the vertical axis and then sort of shows this negative exponential um, curve. That 
is tells a very powerful, very simple story. And that's what we need because that is what travels. It's not all the statistical models and sort of developing a, 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 a new econometric framework with so many more random variables uh, with slightly tweaked distributions and, and, and uh, allows you to bring in yet more endogenous variables. It's about these kinds of things that we need to find. It's about what you communicate. So stories and um, visuals will be very important. One of the reasons why I liked the work of Dylan Mahmoudi and his team is that they actually use these, um, these, the, this, this qualitative GIS approach to create maps that show very, very clearly who has access to the green loop and who doesn't. That has the potential in that particular context for a very simple, powerful story to be told. That's not the only way, but it is the way you can at least generate an audience within policy making. My experience is also that, at least in the UK, talking to policymakers at local level is much easier than at national level. At local level, people are much more willing to take on board um, sort of insights from qualitative research. And I was surprised when a couple of years ago I was asked to be involved in, in a project about uh, different uh, installations for charging electric vehicles in, in Oxford, different on-street technologies. We did the, the, the monitoring and evaluation for that. I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But they said, we don't want quant. We want a qualitative study because we really want to understand why people do these what people think, what they, what they feel, and why that is. And that's really, really interesting. We ended up doing a mixed method approach, and we did use quant materials. And it would be silly to not use the data that come from the installations that are put in, in the public realm. But there is opportunity there. And I think one of the good things of transport policy audiences diversifying, diversifying in terms of uh, their social background, but also people coming from different disciplinary backgrounds, not only engineering or economics or transport planning or quantitative geography, but also from innovation studies, from anthropology, um, from policy studies, from environmental studies, that brings a wider range of interests, dispositions, and uh, views to the table. And I think that's a good thing. And I think we'll see more of that going forward. I'm actually quite optimistic about that, um, which is a rare thing because I'm not known to be an optimist. <laughs> That's a very, it, it's a very short question, but it's one of the most difficult questions you can ask of a geographer. And there's different views on this. Um, but many would argue that place is much more about things that have meaning, that are associated with emotions, atmospheres. Um, Whereas space is much more abstract uh, and is, for instance, a two-dimensional plane on which you map things that's typically seen as, as a form of space. Um, and place is probably the most, concept, most contested concept in geography. Um, the way I understand it is not sort of in a very humanistic sense, but it's much more in, in line with the work of of Doreen Massey, one of the most famous, most influential geographers, who's written about how places are sort of condensations of 
events and processes that have happened in a particular location over a long period of time and that are very much influenced by what is happening elsewhere. So she talks about a global sense of place. Look up the, that phrase and you will get a really helpful article by her that's sort of really, yeah, we do it, in, we offer it to our undergraduates in geography and they always really like it. Final question. Uh, yes, thanks for your presentation. Um, in your response to previous uh, questions, you uh, used the term for the word we, so you refer to a kind of social group, and that's the academics, and you extend that from transport planners to anthropologists and policy studies. But still, it seems that there is kind of a division of labor. The academics, they provide the narratives, the stories, the imaginaries. But yeah, you exclude a large part of the globe by using the we, the academics. Um, yeah. So that isn't there a kind of tension in the display? Well, the claim you made about we have to rethink epistemology and... Yeah, I wasn't, um, it wasn't my intention to, to denote only academics with the we. I think it's a much broader community that cuts across institutional uh, backgrounds. Um, certainly some people in, in NGOs, uh, um, Slow Cats, for instance, which is a, 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 a global uh, um, NGO around low carbon transport, is, is a very good example. But also in realms of policy making and in communities, because I think I'm. Yeah, I, I, the work, a lot of the work we do is, is sort of informed by an ethos of co production. And it's about working with partners in, in various sectors. Uh, but that doesn't mean that each of the partners does all the same things to the same extent. I think within that, academics still have specific roles and responsibilities. And I think the more sort of the kind of reflections I offer today is obviously quite an academic pursuit. But it, it, we need to think in terms of these broader, quite fuzzy alliances of people um, across different parts of the world and across spatial scales because it goes sort of all the way from the global level uh, which slow cat is operating to what we see in neighborhoods and in local policy environments thank you very much i suggest we take a short break there's coffee and we reconvene in 10 minutes yeah. Ik ben ergens hier op de afdeling. Kunbo is, is een vier, want iedereen heeft een halve blok, dus je zult me wel ergens gaan. Ja, en mijn kantoor is net al samen voor tegenover die van Kunbo. Dan zal het allemaal wel prima. Dank je wel. Graag gedaan.
can I suggest we reconvene because we are bounded by the times for the online recording. We don't want to overrun too much. This is the sixth lecture in the series. Um, after the introduction lecture in which I sort of laid out the broad theme of the series, I have did a number of more conceptual lectures. I talked about mitigation and adaptation. I talked about knowledge. I talked about valuation. This morning I talked about urban development and infrastructure. Now as the final conceptual block, I want to talk about human behavior and action. And then tomorrow, we get less conceptual. I'll be talking about electrification and automation of vehicles in relation to just mobility and uh, platformization, the rise of all kinds of platform services, uh, um, platforms that are used to provide mobility services. So that next time, in a couple of weeks, I will focus on a few tricky topics, long distance mobility, which is very challenging from a, uh, from a climate mitigation point of view. I want to talk about unintended consequences of attempts to intervene in mobility systems. And then the final lecture, we'll look at the most challenging topic of all, which is governance of transformations in, in mobility systems. But today, talk about human behavior. And I'm going to show for the first time this slide, the avoid, shift and approve framework, because it is encapsulating many of the things about behavior change. It assumes that behavior change is needed for all of these uh, elements in, in, the, in the figure. And often, certainly in the academic literature, when we think about behavior change, human beings are imagined as sovereign decision-making subjects. And that holds certainly for the technical rational paradigm that I uh, elaborated last time, sort of the work in, on, on rational utility maximization, for instance, uh, but also for a lot of the literature from behavioral psychology, the theory of planned behavior still assumes a sovereign individual as a decision-maker. I think we can move beyond that, and, and, and I think it's actually valuable to do that if we think about just mobility. So that's what I want to do in this lecture, and I want to do that in three ways. I want to talk a little bit more about how we can imagine human subjects in transport research, and then want to focus on, uh, on, on ways in which we can um, decenter that human subject, and I'll explain what I mean by that in, in a minute. But I want to talk about accessibility, and I want to talk particularly about capability, the capability approach as originally developed by Yamacha Sen. Two years ago, I published a paper in the Journal of Transport Geography in which I reflected on how human subjects are imagined in, in transport research. And the conventional narrative is that certainly within the technical rational paradigm of transport studies, we've seen something of a shift from the assumption of humans as economic men, and they are men for the most part, to a psychological being, homo psychological. And that's often framed as quite a significant change. But you can challenge that, and that's what that paper did. And I used the works of uh, a decolonial theorist, Sylvia Winter, shown on the right-hand side, to make the argument that actually we're still in the, same, uh, in the same sphere. And we still remain 
within what Sylvia Winter calls a mono-humanist understanding of individuals. People are still understood in one particular way. There's one template for how human beings are. And not only that, in that set of understandings of, of human beings in transport research, there's still very much an emphasis if, or, or at least an implicit assumption of growth as a goal and a sign of success. That can be economic growth, it can also be personal growth. If you look at the, the positive psychology uh, uh, approach, for instance, that's still very much framed in terms of personal development, personal growth, and quite a quantitative understanding of that too. And what I did in the paper use, was to use Sylvia Winter's work to argue that uh, that way of understanding human beings in relation to transport unintentionally creates undeserving inferior others, typically along existing lines of inequality, especially race, but also class, gender, sexuality, age, so on and so forth. So that kind of brings us to an impasse. If you want to read more about that, I can refer you to the paper. I just want to sort of take that as a starting point today and think about, okay, what do we do given that? And I would say that there are three ways forward. Uh, and I don't think any of them is better. It depends very much on the context you're in and, and what we're focusing on. Uh, but I do want to briefly go through all three of these. In, in many ways, the revisionist approach is to rework existing frameworks, rework the theory of planned behavior, rework uh, um, sort of random utility maximization approaches uh, to allow for more differentiation. And uh, I think there are some tools that can help in that regard, at least to some extent. There is mixed logic modeling, which allows for differentiation. There is uh, multi-group structural equation modeling that can be used to sort of uh, bring in some degree of differentiation. There is, of course, limitation here because that variability must be compatible with the basic architecture of the approach. What in uh, uh, what certain social theories called alterity, deep change is not allowed for. It's sort of deep differentiation. Uh, it is not allowed for in, in, in this approach. So I think this has limitations and it means that we need to think very carefully about when and where we use these kinds of approaches, theory of planned behavior, utility maximization frameworks. And we need to be very humble about the extent to which they can be generalized beyond the sample that is included in the analysis. So I think a lot of the claims about validity, about external validity are actually quite deeply problematic. A second way is to experiment with other understandings of the human subject. And there are a range of different ways that can be done. I've mentioned a couple here. Sort of think about post-structuralist philosophy. Uh, yeah, sort of people like, like, like uh, Michel Foucault, for instance, Judith Butler. Um, and I think that is quite interesting and there is some interesting work being done in that space. You can look at the American pragmatists uh, William James, John Dewey, to some extent what I mentioned about white hat and sort of body-mind worlds uh, being mutually imminent to one another is very close to that approach as well. There's the decolonial uh, theory uh, of people like Sylvia Winter, but certainly also many others. There's a range of work from uh, Taoism, for instance, and other East Asian philosophies that we can draw upon. Our Chinese colleagues are perhaps best placed to do that, but uh, I think there's really not much being done in that space, and I think there's a huge potential there to, uh, to do that. And what that would result in is the creation of relational understandings of the human subject. Um, we can, of course, also think about various endogenous 
philosophies of the sort of indigenous people, um, for, where there's a lot of emphasis also on the idea that the subject as a separate self-subsistent entity does not exist. It is purely something that emerges from relational processes that co-evolve with their environment in the wider cosmos. I mean, Aboriginal thought, for instance, various African philosophies could be drawn on as well. That is interesting. And uh, in the paper I mentioned before, I, uh, I, I drew on some of the ideas from Sylvia Winter to reimagine that human subject. Works to a degree in some contexts, but is certainly not uh, the be all and end all. And I would certainly not want to suggest that this is the only way in which we need to th take things forward. There's a, a third way forward, which builds on existing work um, in, in certain strands of, of, of social science, which in some ways is the most radical because it is about decentering the human. It's basically saying, don't fret too much about how you imagine that human subject. Just focus on what's happening, on what people are doing, or what people can do. So focus on actual practices, as social practice theory does, or focus on action potentials, which is very much what certain versions of capability theory, or cap the capability approach, do. So, in terms of that um, second approach that I just showed you here, about experimenting with other understandings of human subjects, um, I mentioned the, 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 the winter project, the winter paper, um, but I sort of last year also published a chapter talking about well-being, a subjective well-being in particular in relation to different understandings of the human subject, and it's published in that book. It's open access, and if you can't find it, let me, uh, yeah, let me know, and I'm very happy to share it. Um, and what I did in that chapter was sort of, on the back of thinking in different ways about the human subject, also challenge certain understandings of well-being and certain ideas that underpin the way subjective well-being is understood in a lot of the happiness literature and also in the transport literature. Because I think there are two key assumptions that there are universal and stable affective and cognitive states like uh, happy, uh, sad, so on and so forth. These are sort of assumed to exist everywhere and sort of to be completely independent of time, place and culture. And actually, uh, there's work in cultural psychology and, and sociology that, that shows that uh, it's not as simple and argues that the whole idea of understanding well-being in this, in this way and, and the idea that we have to be positive sort of, they ground that in the development of capitalism. And there's sort of, there's this brilliant phrase of the tyranny of positivity, that in neoliberal capitalism with its service orientation, uh, it is, you have, you, you are sort of, it is, you're under the obligation to be positive and to be happy. It's not something that you choose, but it's sort of a, a, sort of a range of social dynamics that make uh, us sort of take that as, as a, as a norm that's completely internalized and seen as the standard. There's a, another assumption that's made in a lot of the literature on subjective well-being around people having innate needs that pre-exist their expression through language or other means and are again independent of time, place and culture. And again, there is work in, in, in anthropology an evolutionary um, anthropology that, that challenges some of these ideas. Um, there's uh, work that's, I think, really interesting and in, in showing that emotions are emergent products of multiple biologically evolved mechanisms that depend on cultural learning because the developing brain bootstraps embodied concepts into its wiring and thereby creates an internal model 
for how to best regulate the body across a range of situations within the constraints of a cultural world. This embraining of culture may allow people to survive and thrive as a social species in a wide variety of contexts. So I think there's some really interesting thinking going on here about how nature and culture sort of are uh, integrated and tangled and are not as separate as we usually make them to be. And again, this idea about needs not necessarily being innate gets really challenged by many West, non-Western philosophies. I already mentioned Taoism, Buddhism, indigenous philosophies. Um, and, and again, a, a number of Western philosophies as well. We had uh, the, uh, the, the example of the American pragmatists before, um, and also the, the thinking of people like, like Whitehead. So try to think in a different way about well-being and about people can sort of be quite helpful also for mobility studies. And, and two things are particularly um, uh, relevant. One is to think about well-being, again, as, as a series of processes through which desirable qualities and goals emerge out of actions, experiences, and learnings in particular times and places. So there's no universal cognitive state that is desirable, but this is something that we sort of learn over time through a range of social and biological and neurological processes. And the other way to think about well-being is again to focus on action possibilities and to think about capabilities in particular. But before talking about capabilities, I want to briefly talk about practice theory, because it's quite a popular framework in transport studies at the moment used by a range of different people to think about how practices change, how behaviors change. Many people uh, draw on the work of Elizabeth Chauve at the University of Lancaster, and uh, she's, she's offered a really nice condensation of a wide range of different theories uh, into a, a, a very uh, um, manageable framework, I would say. Manageable in the sense that it's, it's quite accessible for people who don't know all the literatures that she's drawing on. And actually this figure here is the, the, the most condensed summary of the framework that I can imagine because her idea is that a practice like driving or cycling is the constant amalgamation of three sets of elements. Materials, physical elements like uh, infrastructures and, 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 and vehicles and artifacts. Meanings like freedom uh, and, and, and uh, control, for instance, when we're talking about driving. And procedures, which is about competences and therefore about skills. It's also about frameworks, including rules and, uh, and laws. And uh, this very simple framework lies at the basis of what these practice theories, theory studies do, which is essentially understand changes in mobility as changes in the configuration of these three elements over time. The interesting thing is that they don't talk that much about individuals. Individuals are simply seen as the carriers of the practice. And they are sort of not, no longer center stage. They've been decentered from the analysis. Now, you can ask questions about whether that is entirely correct, uh, because I think in, there are circumstances where human subjects do intervene. There are, for instance, situations where they encounter a problem and are actually made to think. So to think about um, a fork in the road is a very simple example that John Dewey, for instance, examples. That's where that human subject comes into being and actually makes a choice. Now, that situation may be fairly rare, but it does occur. These, this 
approach has been used quite extensively in, in transport research, and this is actually an early example about cycling in the UK, Fiona Spotswood and, and colleagues, where they've talked about, okay, that, that they've used essentially interviews to identify what the key elements in the materials, meanings, and uh, competencies categories are, sort of as a, as a narrower version of what I showed before as procedures. Um, and I think some of this reproduces what we already know from other traditions, but some elements are also novel and are typically not taken into account. So uh, things around clothing, things about showering, sort of bodily odors, very culturally important and, and a, a major constraint on cycling in, in certain cultures, certainly in, in, in the UK. Um, those kinds of elements are usually sort of below the radar in, in your average transport studies paper on, on cycling. So I think it, this adds some, uh, some useful uh, additional insights and I think this needs to be developed further. But yeah, there are some issues around uh, uh, decision making that perhaps need to be integrated further into this. A different approach that also decenters the human subject is uh, the, the capabilities approach originally proposed by Amartya Sen. I showed all of these books or at least two of them on an earlier slide uh, and I think these three books are the best introduction to capability, thinking on capabilities uh, that are currently available. The book by Amartya Sen by Martin Nussbaum and the book by Ingrid Robains offers a, a sort of really comprehensive overview of different versions of the capabilities approach. Because there is not a single approach, there are multiple approaches. And uh, today I will be talking mostly about the ideas of Amartya Sen, the work of people like uh, Martin Nussbaum is quite different from this. Sen was a, is a development economist and wanted to provide, amongst others, an alternative to the GDP as the most widely used indicator of development and, and thought about understanding development and well-being in terms of freedom to do and be what you have reason to value, what you value. So it's basically about what you want to do and become in a non-prescriptive non manner. So he doesn't impose what people should do and there's no, no standard that's for people to decide themselves. This is clearly where the liberalist leanings in, in Amartya Sen's work come to the fore. It has limitations but it also has a number of appealing features and we do see more uptake of capability approach thinking in transport studies. I think some of these some of it appeals some of its appeal lies in the flexibility and the adaptability of the framework and uh, Robain's book that I showed on the previous page previous slide offers some very good insights on this but also talk a little bit about adaptations uh, further on it's very useful because it privileges equality of opportunity over equality of outcome. And when we're thinking about questions of inequality and equity, that is quite important. Because often what you see also in a lot of transport literature is that people use observed behavior as an indicator of inequality. But you never quite know what that actually m means or says because it may be that people are completely prevented from doing something or people have for some could in theory have done something but have for whatever reason not done so. Um, so if you do research uh, with older adults and the changes in mobility they experience as they age which is one of the things I've worked on in the past and you interview people or you in a survey and you ask them how do you perceive your mobility how satisfied are you with your mobility they will quite often also say I'm very satisfied and they've kind of adapted 
their thinking, their preferences, their aspirations, to the changes in their mobility, the, the shrinking opportunities as a result of the, the, the changes in their body and mind have led to what Amartya Sen always calls adaptive preferences. So this is a way of moving beyond that and focusing on the opportunities that people have. That's not entirely without issue, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But if we're thinking about justice, this is a very interesting approach. It also ties in with some of the thinking by people like Torsten Hagerstrand and his space-time accessibility approach, who also said that if, as policymakers, we can provide people different options, but in a liberal democracy, in an advanced liberal democracy, it's, it's quite another thing to actually directly influence people's behavior. And that will, that will trigger more resistance. It will trigger more um, backlash in many, many cases. A third, um, a third advantage appeal is that uh, the approach is ethically individualist, but not ontologically individualist. And with that I mean that it takes as a starting point that every individual matters and deserves a decent or a dignified life. But it doesn't imply that the individual in the philosophical sense is primordial or the basis or even more important than social collectives. So they not they're not the ultimate category that we need to work with when we're thinking about behavior, behavior change. And the final appeal is the commitment to value pluralism. There's no privileging of a single perspective as you have in utility maximization or in eudaimonic psychology where it's always about self-actualization, meaning in life, personal growth in similar terms. And in a transport context, I think this commitment to value pluralism is also very helpful because in policy we still see a, if not overt, then at least implicit privileging of commuting as the main form of transport that we need to cater for. And a quite consistent undervaluation of what mobilities of care and sort of relating to everyday care for uh, for the self, for uh, one's loved ones, households, friends, relatives, and so on. So this kind of allows us a, a way of circumventing these kinds of, of assumptions. The strip to its bare essentials, this is Sen's version of the capability approach. And obviously this is an abstraction and not an innocent one in light of what I discussed in the previous lecture. Um, but I, it, it's a very good starting point for uh, developing the key idea. Because the key idea for Sen is that having a resource available at all times, say a bike, does not automatically constitute a real opportunity to ride it. Actually riding a bike is in the language of Sen a functioning. These are actually achieved activities, including trips and everyday activities at destinations, as well as interactions, experiences, and other states of being for human individuals. Capabilities, in contrast, are the real opportunities or potentials to realize such functionings. The capability to cycle means that in a particular situation, a person is genuinely free to ride a bike, even if she decides not to do that. This capability is part of a wider capability set, the nexus of interconnected capabilities that represents the freedom that a person has for Sen. Conversion factors, bottom left, are critical to the distinction between a resource and a capability. Conversion factors are the conditions and processes that allow resources, such as the available bike, to be converted into capabilities and ultimately functionings. There are usually multiple sets of conversion factors at play. 
and Robains and others have classified these into three groups. There are personal conversion factors, like attributes and capacities of one's bodies, skills, learning abilities and memories. And you can have a bike available, but if you don't know how to ride it, it's a very obvious point, but it makes the resource really a, a pretty useless thing. Conversion factors can also be social and institutional, so public policies, social norms, social hierarchies, power relations all play a role. And they can be environmental, qualities of the built environment and uh, the physical world more generally. The key issue here is that a capability is unobserved. It is real in the sense that it exists, but it cannot be experienced directly. And that makes it very difficult to investigate it, let alone quantify it. There are very various approaches that have done that, and, and I've, uh, I've, I've written a paper about that that I'm happy to share. But uh, it is quite challenging. One of the people who've done this and have published extensively on this, also in the Journal of Transport Geography, is Jean Ryan in a series of studies on uh, the mobility of uh, older adults. And uh, she's made this really nice diagram that kind of is a more extended version of what I've just shown you. Uh, so you've got resources, conversion factors, capabilities, and then uh, functionings, and ultimately some, some indication of well-being. And it, this kind of works. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a talk to a uh, Department for Transport staff in the UK who was very keen to create an infrastructure, a public infrastructure for electric vehicles and, and to sort of support the uptake of electric vehicles. And most of their policies are just about putting in place pieces of equipment. And, and I think you can use this framework in a very simple way to, to argue that that is not sufficient for actually getting people to, uh, to, to change their behavior and, and to, to go for the uptake of a vehicle. So you can have, in terms of resources, a rapid charger nearby. You can have the money to use it. You can have the information that you need in order to use it all the resources. But you also need the skill. You need to feel reasonably safe. So this is particularly at night. Uh, in the dark, this is a real issue. We've done research that shows this. There's going to be competing demands. There's going to be other people who also want to use that charger. And particularly now, the EV uptake is accelerating. We see much more pressure and much more uncertainty about is uh, the, the charging infrastructure actually available. If you are able, well, sorry, the, the, the capability then that emerges out of the combination of the two is the capability to charge, but also the capability to get to places with your car and potentially also a sense of tranquility if you were the person who was liable to range anxiety or, or, the, or charging anxiety as, as, as examples. So that you can actually drive, you can actually go to people, you will actually have the peace of mind which will contribute to your flourishing as a general indicator of, of well-being. So what this does is sort of really make this distinction between opportunity and outcome. It's a very simple sequence that allows you to, to draw in some of these factors that matter to what people might be able, able to do. It does more, however. It can help us to think about accessibility. One reason why I like the capability approach is that it can be linked to what I take to be transport geography's quintessential concept. More specifically, I would say that accessibility can be, can be seen as the two or three dimensional representation of capability on a conventional map, or when we're talking in time geographical terms in a space-time aquarium. But it needs to be specified properly. So place-based accessibility measures, which is a characteristic 
of a place and kind of measures the relative ease with which other places can be reached is a resource in this way of thinking. So distance to the nearest opportunity, cum cumulative opportunity measures, gravity-based measures, the three most popular types of accessibility measures are very useful indicators of resource, but they don't indicate capability because various conversion factors have not been taken into account. In fact, certain versions of space-time accessibility can be understood as a capability. Now, not everyone may know what a space-time accessibility measure is, but it's derived from this graph from, uh, that goes back to Hagerstrand's work in the 1960s. You have a three-dimensional aquarium with space on the x and y axis and uh, time on the z axis. And the, uh, the space-time prism, as it's called, called, get us all the opportunities in space and time a person or an object can occupy given a series of constraints. People will have to be at certain locations at certain points in time. That's when the line is vertical. And then, depending on the speed with which they can move, you get sort of uh, this, this, this cone shape. And because people will have to be back at another location at a certain point in time, you get sort of two cones um, put on top of each other. And uh, space-time accessibility measures sort of either measure the volume of the prism or look at the projection on the two-dimensional space, which is known as the potential path area. And with GIS, you can do really flashy images. This is from a paper by um, Harvey Miller and colleagues published a couple of years ago. Uh, it's an area, a neighborhood in central uh, uh, Columbus in Ohio, and it demonstrates the space-time prism available in the morning for four individuals located, living in slightly different streets in this South Linden neighborhood. And uh, yeah, we're now with current geocomputational uh, capabilities, you can create these very powerful graphs. And you do that for each individual, what they do in this paper to then create an average version out of it. But I just wanted to show how you can, how you can use the GIS to do this. This is the potential path area is from a, a paper that's much older, more than 20 years ago, by uh, Maple Kwan. Again, Columbus, Ohio. On the left-hand side, you see the projection of the prism. I have sort of the home is the, the triangle. The workplace is the, the green uh, uh, little circle, and this is about where people can uh, can go to have uh, dinner in a restaurant. And the one that she, had, uh, in the end, picked is the was sort of where you see the, the, the little star on, on the top left. And the algorithm that she developed, remember this is 25 years ago, kind of indicates which restaurants are in the feasible opportunity set. FOS stands for feasible opportunity set. Um, but then she does something what very few space-time accessibility measures have done since, and that is bring in another set of constraints about which rest restaurants people are actually familiar with, which they know of. So that's, you could say, another set of conversion factors in capability language. So you see that the differentiation on the, on the right-hand side between the, uh, the little uh, triangles which are outside of the, the area that she's familiar with. And the, 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 on, uh, the, the little circles are the restaurants that she could have chosen. So this brings us to a much closer understanding of a, what a capability might be in a geographical sense. And I think there's much more work along this line needed uh, going further. I think the space-time accessibility uh, 
literature is too much focused on sort of objective conditions and sort of technical proficiency rather than sort of really bringing in the additional factors that limit the, the, the set of opportunities that people are taken. We are sort of currently doing a, a piece of work where we bring in air quality and variations in air quality in a space-time accessibility measure, which is important maybe not for everyone, but certainly for some groups of people. And we're looking particularly at women with small children. So, so I think there is some work being done, but there's much more required. This approach is useful, and the diagram sort of with the bare essentials is quite helpful, but it is also making an, a range of uh, abstractions. And there are multiple I could talk about, I just want to highlight two. One is that this renders things very static, unduly so. And that is very, hands, very useful if you want to do econometric modeling, but not necessarily the way uh, the, these processes work out in, in real life. The other thing is that it is really focusing on one capability or the capabilities associated with a particular person, and it doesn't bring out the way my capabilities are entangled with yours and those of all kinds of other people. So I want to sort of briefly elaborate that, these two points. One thing that we can do to, to, to make this framework less static is to, is to re start with conversion factors and think about conversion processes and events and sort of make that much more dynamic across multiple time cycles and, and time scales, sorry. And if we're thinking about something ab around cycling to continue that uh, example, you can think about the weather, but you can also think about how you may have to share the road with large vehicles um, in particular circumstances, particular contexts, at particular times. So bringing in more of these kinds of more situational factors give it a much more dynamic quality. And it draws attention to what some people in the capability literature call the security of a capability, which is about the risk of the capability being lost. And I think that's a really interesting concept to think about, particularly if we think about questions of equity, distributional justice, and so on. Because people may have certain opportunities, but if the risk of losing them is much bigger, then that has implications for how we go forward, how we evaluate those options, and what we may want to do as policymakers, for instance. So the idea here is really that capabilities are not static, but always expanding, contracting, changing. They depend on, on what happens and what takes place in the world. Capability is often quite limited. In many instances, there isn't as much to choose from as we might think in the first instance. It's a point that Hagerstrand also made already in the early 1970s in relation to space-time accessibility. Still, if we want to understand whether a policy intervention, intervention that seeks to contribute to equality of opportunity actually makes a difference to what people do, then we do also have to talk about functionings and, and look at that link between capabilities and functioning. Often, this is thought of in terms of a choice process. And it, originally when I drew this figure, I didn't have realization there, I had choice there, I moved it, I, I, I sort of swapped it because I think realization allows for a broader range of ways through which functionings may, may come, um, come, uh, uh, come about that may relate to habit, it may relate to routine practice, it may be about impulses, it may be about neurological processes that we have very little influence on. Um, but there is something also about this idea 
of robustness of a capability. It's about the probability of the capability being realized as a functioning. And again, this brings us back to something I showed at the end of last hour. It's the same picture, but we arrived there at a different way. Because the narrowing down of capability, which then almost maps onto the functioning, is very clear here. This capability for these people who, for whom these bikes are intended is very strongly dependent on the fact that the vehicle is adapted and that you can afford to use it and given the price that is not insignificant. There being a co-rider, there being a special track, there being a supportive environment to offer care, enthusiasm and enjoyment. Without all those elements being in place, the capability and the functioning do not exist. So they're almost equal to one another. And I think this is a situation we see quite often in situations of uh, precarity, in situations of de uh, de depravity. So we have, high, we have low security and a high risk of capabilities being lost. And we have high robustness where actually if you have the capability, you might also, that it becomes a, a functioning quite rapidly. So both of these concepts are quite helpful in how we think about equity and distribution in relation to mobility. But we also need to think about how capabilities and functionings of people are interrelated. Because if we enhance the capability enjoyed by a person A or a group X, diminishes those of person B or group Y, then we may end up with a problem. And the classic example is sort of thinking about cars. If we want to uh, address transport disadvantage by just everyone, by giving everyone a car, we end up creating problems somewhere for some other people, somewhere else at some point in time. Because that person B, that group Y may be nearby in space and in time, it may also be far away. If a and person A and group X all start to use big SUVs that, uh, that guzzle petrol on very busy city roads, then that has implications for the people they share the road with and who are much vulnerable, or for people somewhere else in the future whose lives may be affected by climate change to which these functionings contribute. Of course, the contribution may be very small, but if we add all this up, we start to see the interrelations between all these functionings. So this is also a way of getting at questions of not simply intragenerational justice, but also intergenerational justice, which I think is really important to consider as well. Where does this leave us? What I've tried to argue today is that just transformations in mobility are helped by challenging and reworking this, this idea or this set of assumptions around sovereign decision-making subjects. There are multiple ways we can do that, and I don't think that one is necessarily superior to the other. It all depends on the situation at hand. I do think the capability approach offers potential. It comes with limitations. Um, it's certainly not the be all and end all for doing things, but it does offer us a way, at least a framework for thinking about the entangled nature of capabilities. And that is something we need to put center stage if we're really serious about just transitions. Thank you very much. That's the end of this lecture. <laughs> Questions? <laughs>